Judges, Old Testament book of Judges. We're going to go to the very first chapter in chapter number one. Judges chapter number one. And uh, we're going to preach quickly this morning so that we can get downstairs and celebrate. Amen. There's food involved. We'll preach short. If there's no food involved, uh, we'll preach long. Judges in chapter number one. And if you were here in the Sunday school hour, you noted in the Sunday school hour that I was a little bit different than I normally am uh, doing a question and answer time in Sunday school. And I struggled with the question, but I believe the Lord still blessed it nonetheless. Amen. I learned a lot from it and uh, as far as from my own personal study. And so the Bible is full of a lot of great things. We just have to get in there and find out what it is. Uh, and, and so we enjoyed that. We'll be back again in that this next Sunday in the Sunday school hour. And I'm excited, uh, even while reading my Bible this morning, about the message that the Lord gave me that, Lord willing, will be for next Sunday morning service. And so, boy, I like it when the Lord just sort of directs me. Sometimes I get nervous. I always think I'm going to run out of things to preach about. Uh, and, uh, but I, then I realize that book is so big, and I'll read something five or six or seven times, and then all of a sudden I'll read it another time, and the Lord will say, you need that. Why don't you do something with that? And so that's always good uh, when God does that. Gave me two thoughts this morning uh, in my own personal uh, Bible study before the service. And this was a thought that the Lord laid on my heart several months ago. And uh, I was listening to another man preach from this passage of Scripture, and the Lord impressed some things upon me. I'm not going to preach his message, but I will steal his text. Amen. Uh, the, you know, the, uh, uh, the Bible, uh, there's nothing new under the sun, the book of Ecclesiastes says. And, uh, and so, uh, but we'll give you some thoughts uh, from this passage and pray that the Lord would help us as it will not be. It'll be a little bit different in my preaching this morning uh, than maybe what you're used to uh, going verse by verse. We're not going to do that. I just want to draw a thought from this text uh, here in the scripture. And uh, the song was fitting. The tempter will be banished one day. And, uh, and I'm glad for that. We're going to talk about him this morning. And he never likes it when we talk about him, especially when we expose him for who he really is. And the Bible exposes the devil. Uh, Satan, Lucifer, for who he really is, okay? He's not some funny-looking guy uh, with a pitchfork and a forked tail and uh, horns, but the Bible says that he has transformed himself into an angel of light, okay? Uh, the devil is not an unattractive person. He is an attractive person. That way he, he is a magnetic personality. Read the book of the Revelation and read in the book of uh, Thessalonians where the Antichrist, uh, full of the devil, will rise up in the last day, right? The false prophet and the false beast, or I'm sorry, the beast and the false prophet will rise up in the last days and they will be have a magnetic personality. They'll draw people to them. Not going to do that holding a pitchfork, uh, looking silly and crazy. And so we must be, uh, we must be, we must guard ourselves uh, against the devil. And the way that we guard ourselves against the devil is to know how it is that he is coming after us. And how do we know that? We know it from the Word of God. You say, is that in the book of Judges? It sure is. Stand together with me as we honor the Word of God. If you cannot stand, that is fine. I understand that. But if you can stand, we'd invite you to, as we read two verses in the book of Judges and chapter number 1. And let's look, please, at verse number 6, Judges chapter number 1. And verse number 6, the Bible says this, But Adonai Bezek uh, fled, and they pursued after him, and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his great toes. And Adonai Bezek uh, uh, said, Three score and ten kings, having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table, as I have done, so God hath requited me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. If you would look with me at verse number 6 and also in verse number 7, we will get uh, uh, sort of our thought uh, out of this text of the Bible. Uh, if you look at the latter phrase, the last phrase of verse number 6, the Bible says that they caught him and caught him and watch and cut off his thumbs and his great toes. If you look at verse number 7, in the uh, second phrase of that verse, uh, here Adonai Bezek is uh, talking and he said, three score and ten kings having their thumbs and their great toes cut off. I want to talk about that thought this morning. Strange thought this morning we're going to talk about. But here's my thought. This is the, uh, what the Lord gave me as a title. Something worse than death. 
There is something that is worse than death. You say, how could that be? I want to show you, uh, according to the scripture, of something that is worse than death. Father, we would ask this morning for an extra measure of preaching power. We need thy Holy Spirit's wisdom. And I want to, Lord, uh, be filled with all the knowledge uh, and, and wisdom that you would impart to me as we looked at these passages together uh, some months ago and even this week in developing the rest of these thoughts that we've put now uh, pen to paper and put some things down after reading your word, things that you laid upon my heart. God, I pray I'd be a help to someone. Lord, this morning there's uh, so many faces in the room, some uh, very familiar, some somewhat familiar, some maybe unfamiliar to me. And, uh, and I pray, Lord, that some, no matter what their, what their state is, what their case is, why they're here this morning, they're here by divine appointment. Maybe they're not saved and they've never put their faith and trust in thee and thee alone. I pray that above all things that I would do, I would point people to Calvary. Help us to start... Uh, wherever we start in the scripture, but help us to end at the cross and see the Savior there bleeding and dying and suffering for our sins. And then help us to go to that garden tomb where you are no longer, as we realized last week, but you are seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for the saints. And so help them that are strangers to the grace of God, please save them through the power of the Holy Spirit this morning and stir the rest of our hearts. Someone needs the message. I dare say we all need it. May we all receive it uh, as the, in the way that you would have us to. And the only way that can be done is if you'll do the work in my stead. I'll preach, but you'll have to preach through me. I'm yielding myself wholly and completely to you. The only way that I know how is here I am, Lord. Take me and use me. We'll ask all of these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, our soon coming King, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Something worse than death. Several months ago when studying and reading from this passage of Scripture, I got to thinking about this King. And uh, it's, a, it's a weird story in the Bible. It may even, uh, to some degree, when you think about it, it may bring a little chuckle to you. You know, there are some funny things in the Bible. It's all right. It's a serious book, but I don't think that God, the uh, Bible says that God who sits in the heavens will laugh, and so I think God has a sense of humor. Matter of fact, I know that God has a sense of humor. I'm looking at his sense of humor this morning, and so I know hey, he has a sense of humor. Uh, I know he's also very good at doing some things. I'm very excellent at doing some things because uh, I looked at myself this morning in the mirror too. And, uh, and so uh, he has a sense of humor, that's you. He's very good at creating some things, that's me. Uh, but uh, you say, boy, you're not too conceited. Uh-uh, just a little bit. Just a little bit, all right? Uh, but uh, it's a kind of a strange, somewhat funny story, isn't it? I mean, here's a guy that uh, is, gets his thumbs and his big toes cut off. And again, just like the story that we read this morning in the Scripture... Uh, about the man that is there uh, at the pool of Bethesda uh, when the water is troubled, waiting to be healed. Uh, just like that story, somewhat of a strange story in the Scripture. Not put there to take up just uh, uh, lines in the Bible, but put there for a specific purpose. And so in this passage of Scripture is the only time you're ever going to find this analogy or this, uh, uh, the, this, these words put this way about some kings getting their thumbs and their toes, or this king, and some others getting their thumbs and toes cut off. And so it must be there for some significance. There must be something, some thought. You know, I was reading this week, and I won't chase this story, and I'm going to look and see if there's any preachers that have ever preached from it. And I won't even tell you the story. I don't even know how you could ever preach from it, but I was preach I was reading the Bible, actually this morning, uh, in my study, and I was reading about David, or it might have been yesterday, reading about David uh, and when does Saul Paul uh, wanted to sort of get him killed. He said, I'll use the Philistines to do that. And he said, and I'll tell you how I'll do that. I'll have him marry my daughter and that'll make him the king's son-in-law. And then they'll want to kill him because he's the king's son-in-law. And then he said, and then he put uh, sort of some stipulation on it. He said he had to go down and he had to kill some Philistines. And I'm not going to tell you the rest of the story because David goes and does that. And then he does some other things. And I don't really understand what the significance is, Brother Jeff, of all of that. And it's really a strange story, and I want to know if any preachers ever preached about it uh, in a mixed company of people. Uh, but I'm sure there's something that is to be said there. And when I read that, I almost go, what? 
Well, when I read this, I go, what? What in the world? Did I cut off? I mean, I'm going to capture you. Imagine that. I'm going to capture you. And you're a wicked, I'm going to capture you. I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to cut off your thumbs and your big toes. And you're going to say to me, what? You know, several times in the scripture you will find, uh, it's just, it's strange. You say, no, I don't want to, I mean, you just as soon kill me. Uh, several times in the scriptures, uh, you will see strange stories along those lines. And they're all significant. I read of a king, uh, as a matter of fact, one of the last kings uh, over the nation of Israel. And right now his name is escaping me. Uh, but if you read in the book of Kings, in the book of Chronicles, you'll read about this man. And, uh, and he is captured by the enemy, by the uh, enemy armies, and he is captured. And they brought him uh, to a place, and uh, they had him there bound, and then they brought his sons, his offspring, his boys, the ones he had given birth to. How, what their ages were, I do not know. I'm sure, I don't know how many was there. The Bible might uh, say, but uh, the story says that they brought his sons before him. He's standing there, and there's his sons. And they, uh, the enemy army said, kill the sons, while the father is watching his sons be murdered. After his sons are killed in front of him, they have watched, he's watched his own boys die. Directly after that, they poked his eyes out. So the last thing that he would ever see on this earth was his own sons die before him. And then he's taken captive and spends the rest of his life in captivity. That's a strange story in the Bible, isn't it? I mean, but think about that. I, could you imagine something like that happening to you? And you would have to go the rest of your life with the last image burned into your mind now, before you lost your eyes was your own offspring, your own children, so that your name could never be carried on dying in front of you is as I read this story in the scripture I think about what a strange story in the scripture about a king uh, that's going to get captured and he's going to lose some body parts and you say how is that worse than death I want to show you this morning why uh, this is worse than death many of us as uh, several months ago or several weeks ago, a month or more ago, uh, now we, we said goodbye to Brother Garrett. Brother Garrett uh, got his thumb uh, severed, shot off, really, uh, severed in, the, in World War II. And so he went through life without one thumb. And his daughter was telling me that he uh, improvised. And so, how, you know, it was hard for him. Now watch this. This will, uh, will kind of help you in the thought here. He couldn't use a screwdriver because he needed his thumb to do that. And so they said that literally on his belly, it was, it was wore out. The, the, the hair was, there was no hair or anything there on that part of him because he would push himself against it. And he learned how to use a screwdriver very efficiently. And he had to make do. You say, why didn't he use the other hand? I'm sure that he did. But how many of us, you know, we got to use this one or you're in a place and you can only use that one. But he couldn't do it without his thumb to hold on to that. You ever try to hold a screwdriver like that? You're not going to have a very good grip. So he had to improvise. And that was with one thumb missing. But here we have a soul, we, we have a, a man with both thumbs and both toes missing. I looked up Adonai Bazak. There's not much mentioned of him in the Bible. If you look here in Judges in chapter number 1, you will find that the children of Israel are going against, Joshua is now dead, and we're going into the Judges stage of the Bible. And uh, they're going to go against the Canaanites, and Judah is going to go up, and Simeon, his brother, is going to go with him. They go against the Canaanites and the Perizzites, all right? Uh, and, uh, and, and one of the kings, is named Adonai Bezek. Adonai Bezek, and they fight against him. Uh, and the Bible says in verse 5, and they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek. Isn't that interesting? It was named after him. He named the place after himself. And they fought against him, and they slew the Canaanites and the Perizzites. All right? But now watch. This king is going to get away. He's going to run. And so I got to thinking about his name. What does Adonai Bezek mean? It means the king of Bezek. You say, well, whoop dee ding What's the big deal with that? But this was an interesting thing that I did find about his name. Adonai Bezek means, watch this, you'll, th this, you'll like this, it means the Lord of Lightning. 
the Lord of lightning. Adonai Bezak, the Lord of lightning. And then the Lord said this to me. Why don't you go over, preacher? And you don't have to turn here. I'll read it to you. I want you to stay where you are. Uh, but uh, why don't you think about Luke chapter number 10 and verse number uh, 18 when you think about lightning. Now watch. Adonai Bezak, the Lord of lightning. And, and, and here is what Luke 10 and verse number 18 says. Uh, it says, uh, actually verse number 17 says, and the 70 returned again with him. Now stay with me. Watch this thought. If you remember in the text that I just read, Adonai Bezak in verse number 7 of Judges chapter number 1, watch this. He said um, uh, three score and ten or, or 70 kings have I captured. I cut off their thumbs and their big toes. Adonai Bezak means Lord of lightning. And now watch what this text says. Luke 10 verse number 17. And the 70... Huh, same number again. Returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. So here we have a 70, the same as a 70 in another place in the scripture, talking about 10 kings uh, who Adonai Bezak captured and, uh, and cut these body parts off. But now watch verse number 18. Listen to what it says. And, and, and he said unto them, this is the Lord, and he said unto them, I beheld Satan, watch, as lightning fall from heaven. Huh. So I had to ask myself this question. If this fellow's name is the Lord of lightning. And it says in this text that three score and ten kings, 70, like the 70 that I have in Luke chapter number uh, 10. Uh, so I have a 70 and I have a reference to the devil, that's Satan, the, uh, being uh, the Lord saw him as lightning fall from heaven. And then I have a fellow by the name of the Lord of lightning. Could there be an analogy here uh, that this fellow is a picture of Satan, Adonai Bezak? the Lord of lightning. Now I want you to see what Adonai Bezak uh, uh, did, and it is in verse 7. We've read it several times. He captured 10 people, ten, or I'm sorry, 70 kings. He captured 70 kings and cut off their thumbs and their big toes. I want you to think about the devil. And I want you to think about this, these verses that I'll give you. Don't turn, but listen. Uh, 1 Peter 5 and verse number 8, the Bible says, Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. I want to tell you this morning, and you better listen to me right here. This is where it's going to, forget everything else I said, but listen to me this morning. Whether you're lost or whether you're saved, the devil is not your friend. The devil is an adversary. And Christian, let me talk to you for a minute. The Bible says he as a roaring lion. He is also a mocker. He is also a mimicker. He is an imitator. Imitator. He is not original in anything that he does. He imitates Jesus Christ. That's why he's called the Antichrist. That's why he says, uh, I will ascend. I will be like the Most High. I want to be like God. See, he's just an imitator. He wants to be God. And so to be God, he must imitate God. But he will never be God because he is a small g. And the Bible does not say about him that he is a roaring lion. The Bible says that as a roaring lion, he is walking about seeking whom he may devour. And guess who he has in his sights this morning? He has you in his sights this morning, Christian. And he has you in his sights this morning. And he has teenagers in his sights this morning and he has married couples in his sights this morning and he has elderly people and retired people and everyone he has you in his sights and he's walking around and he's seeking whom he may devour and he's seeking whom he may destroy and he wants to tear your life down and he wants to make a wreck of you and he wants to make a mockery out of you and whether you're saved this morning and listen if you're lost this morning the devil is after you too he's not after you so much as to destroy your testimony because you don't have one, but he's after you to take you to hell, where he'll keep you in chains and bondage forever and ever. There is no party there. There is no friends there. There is no booze there, or liquor, or drugs, or any of the other things that the world thinks is going on down there. There's no party in hell. There is separation in hell. There is no God in hell. You're alone, and you're suffering forever and ever and ever, and God desires that no one goes there. 
You say, well, and if he does that, how could a just God send anybody there? God has never sent anybody to hell. The hell was created for the devil and his angels. You might want to read the Bible. It was created for the devil and his angels. And the only way that man goes to hell, yes, they are sent there by God, but they are sent there by God because they have rejected the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And the Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so he wants everyone to be saved. That includes you this morning. All you have to do is trust Jesus Christ. All you have to do is take the free sacrifice that he paid for you on the cross of Calvary. We heard about it last week. He went to the cross. He died for your sin. He took your punishment. He took your beating. He took your hell. And he was there buried, but three days later he came out of the grave he did that for you and he did that for me and so if you go to hell uh, you can go to hell from a church pew or from your couch or from anywhere else you go there because you send yourself there by rejecting Jesus Christ and so the devil this morning is not your friend he is not a friend of anybody he is a loner. He is out for himself. He doesn't even like those that work for him. He's a user. He uses people as tools. And when he's done with them, he throws them aside. He casts them aside. You say, I don't believe that. Really, let's go drive the streets of any major city. Let's, let's read the headlines in the newspaper. Why don't you turn the news on and you find out what the devil does with people? I mean, they do. He, they, he, he, he wrecks their lives and gets them to throw everything away on, uh, on materialism. And, uh, and, and, and wrong relationships. And when he's all done, you know what he does? He just brushes his hands of you and says, well, now that you're wrecked, I don't really have any use for you anymore because you're really not very useful for me. And so uh, I'm going to go over and wreck someone else's life. He is our adversary. And we better understand he is after you. He hates your guts and he wants to kill you. And he don't like it when we say that about him, but that's all right because I know him. So we know that he's our adversary. That's a strong word. You can look it up uh, if you want to later. Uh, that word devour means in your Bible to spiritually destroy, to wreck, or to ruin. 2 Corinthians 2 verse number 11, the Bible says this about this person called the devil and Satan. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. Wow. Paul did not say lest Satan should get an advantage of you. Paul said lest Satan should get an advantage of us. He included himself. He included you and I in the text. He said lest Satan should get an advantage of us. Now watch. For we are not ignorant of his devices. The word devices means his purpose. Do you know the Bible says that you and I aren't to be ignorant of the devil's purposes? We are not to be ignorant of the devil's uh, devices. The word advantage, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. It means benefit or gain. It means profit. Any state or condition of circumstances favorable to success. It is a means to an end. Did you get that? Lest the devil gets a means to an end in your life. Lest the devil gets favorable success in your life. Lest the devil gets any state or condition, any benefit or gain from your life. In other words, that's what he wants. He wants to gain out of your life. He wants to get an advantage out of your life. He wants to get his purpose fulfilled in your life other than the purpose of Jesus Christ. If you're saved, do you know what your purpose is? To please him who hath called you and chosen you to be a good soldier. 2 Timothy and chapter number 3 talks about that. It says that we are to please him who hath chosen us to be good soldiers. Our purpose in life is to please our Heavenly Father. Do you know if you're lost this morning what your purpose in life is? To please your father, to please, to please God. He's not your father yet. You say, well, wait a minute, I can't do that. Sure you can. By accepting his son as your savior, you would be pleasing the heavenly father. And then you're birthed into the family of God. You say, well, does that mean my life's going to be perfect? Nope. Does that mean that all my problems are going to go away? Nope. Matter of fact, you might get a couple of problems. Now, that's a hard sale with salvation, but I'm just going to tell you why. Because the world doesn't now, uh, is going to look at you and say, well, you're one of those Bible thumpers. Sure, watch me. There we go. I thumped the Bible. I'm just trying to live up to what the world calls me. Well, you're one of those uh, old fuddy-duddies. Yup, I'm getting older, and I'm pretty fuddy and duddy most of the time, too. Just hang around. Ask my kids. They'll tell you that. 
Well, you're one of those uh, crazy conservatives. Yup. Well, you're one of those Bible believers. Yup. Well, you're one of those guys that believes in hell. Yup. Uh, by the way, I also believe in heaven. Don't, don't, don't leave that part out because that's where I'm headed. And so I believe in it too. Well, you're just one of those crazy people. Yup. Yeah, I've got a few screws loose. I've got a couple wires crossed. The gerbil has fallen off the wheel several times, and he's probably off this morning. If he were on, I'd preach a lot better. But the gerbil is off the wheel this morning, all right? Yeah, I'm all of those things, so call me all of those things. That's all right. But I want to tell you on the authority of the Word of God that I, we are not to be ignorant of the devil's purpose and the devil's device because he is against us. He doesn't want us to get anything done. He wants to stop our efforts. Well, what does any of that have to do with the text? I want you to think about just a simple, a simple uh, uh, few thoughts that I can give you in probably at least three or four hours. All right. Uh, I want you to see this. So now watch. Let's, here, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think this morning that the devil is after you, Christian. Let me talk to Christians for a moment. I talked to lost people just now. Listen. This message is for you. You need to be saved. Did I say that enough? You need to be saved. You need Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Brother Jeff, I don't think I say that enough in my preaching. You know, sometimes I just want to plow into it, and I want to, you know, give you all the understanding, all the doctrine of the Bible. But the plain hard fact is, is you need Jesus. You need Jesus in your heart. You need to ask him to forgive you of your sins and come into your heart and save you. You will not get to heaven on your own. You cannot work yourself there. You cannot join this church or go through those baptismal waters or put your name on a church roll anywhere, anytime. None of that's getting you to heaven. What you need to do is turn from sin, turn from self, turn from whatever you think is getting you to heaven. And you think something's going to get you there or you don't think anything is going to get you there. Turn from all of that and turn to Jesus Christ and just say, I don't understand it. I don't know all the Bible. He doesn't want you to know all the Bible. I may not be able to figure it all out and to be honest with you, I don't understand all of this salvation stuff, but the best way that I know how, here I am. I'm a wreck. I'm a mess. I messed up everything, and I don't even know what to do, and so here's a wrecked life, but I'm just, you say, I don't want to admit all that. Yeah, that's our problem. We don't want to admit all that, but we might want to admit it, because the best among us is a wrecked life. The best among us has nothing to offer Jesus Christ but yourself, and just say, here I am, Lord, if you'll take me, and I know you will, because the preacher said it, and not just because the preacher said it, he read it from the Bible. And so the Bible says, here I am, Lord, if you'll just take me, oh, Lord, you're going to have to help me, and would you save me? And uh, you say, well, preacher, what's a good reason to get saved? I'll give you a good reason to get saved. To stay out of hell is a good reason to get saved. I was listening to a preacher recently, and he said, uh, he said uh, I was criticized by another preacher because uh, he says I, 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 that uh, I, I preach about hell, and so people get saved just to stay out of hell. And this preacher echoed the same words that happened to me when I was a young boy. He said, that was the reason I got saved, because I knew I was going to go to hell, and if, I got, and if I got saved, I wouldn't have to go there. He said, we can work everything out afterwards. I remember when I got saved. I got saved because I knew if I died that night, uh, and I was laying in my bed at midnight and one o'clock in the morning. I knew I'd die and go to hell. And I was just a, in my preteen years, just right on the edge of being a teenager. And I just remember that I was going to go to hell. And you say, well, I mean, did you do this and do that? I just knew I was going to hell and I, need, I didn't want to go there. That's a great reason to get saved, just to stay out of hell and just to get a relationship with Jesus Christ. Hey, work everything else out later. But if you need to be saved this morning, trust Jesus Christ. Simple. Oh, it's easy. It's easy. Stop complicating it. It's easy. You don't have to come down here and do it. You could do it right where you see. You could do it right now. How do I do that? Man, just say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I'll do it while the preacher's preaching. Come into my heart and save me. I'll tell the preacher after the service. Or I'll get filled with the Spirit of God and jump up on the seat and say, Glory to God, heaven's my home. I'm not going to hell anymore. Whatever happens, I can tell you that Jesus will save you. I can tell you that he'll prepare a place for you over there. I can tell you that he'll forgive you of every sin you've ever committed, every thought you've ever had, every wickedness that you've ever been involved with. He'll forgive it. It's all under the blood, past.
past and present and future. I mean, it's all done with. It's all gone. He doesn't even remember it anymore. You can talk to him about it and he'll say, what are you talking about? You say, how can he do that? Don't know. I'm not God, but he is. And I'm glad for that this morning. You could be saved. But now, Christian, here you, here's, now let's talk to you for a minute. Watch this. The devil wants you. He said to Peter, the devil desires to have you that he may sift you as wheat. He said, he said, Peter, Jesus said, Peter, the devil can't take you to hell. He knows that battle is already over because you're saved and the devil knows that. And he knows that you put your faith and trust in me. And so he can't take you to hell, but he can sure wreck your life while you're here. And here's how he can do it, Christian. Just like Adonai Bazak took 70 kings and just like the children of Israel took Adonai Bazak and they cut off his thumbs and his big toes, you say, what significance would that have? Watch this, number one. This would definitely affect your war life. It would affect your war life. This was a soldier and a king, and it would affect his war life. You say, how in the world would losing your thumb affect your war life? How do you think you'd hold a sword without a thumb? How do you think this morning uh, uh, that you would get anything uh, uh, done? I mean, I, I, I wrote down several thoughts here, and I can't, I can't get, go to all these scripture verses. I wish we could, but you could no longer hold a sword. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 and 4 uh, talks about uh, uh, these things. The sword was the weapon of choice for the soldier to defeat the enemy. You can see that in Leviticus 26 and verse number 8. Uh, and this is, man, the Lord working this out. I was on this verse this morning in Sunday school. And five of you shall chase an hundred, and an hundred shall put ten thousand uh, to flight. And your enemies, watch this, shall fall before you by the sword. Ephesians 6, verse number 17, the last part of that verse, you know what it says? And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so you know how the devil will get you this morning? Something worse than death. He, can't, he won't kill you. I, I hear this all the time from people, and I, I, sometimes I say things, most of the time I don't. Yeah, I was driving the other day, and the devil tried to kill me. He did? Why? Why'd the devil try to kill you? You're getting that much done for God that the devil figured if he took you out, the work of God would stop? Oh, boy. I would say you need to go home and repent of your pride. Amen. Amen, preacher. You say, well, I've said that before. I've said it before, too. But listen, to be quite honest with you, I am not sure that the devil is spending a whole lot of time trying to kill Pastor LaFave. Pastor in the Calvary Baptist Church, Whitmore, I, I'm not saying the devil's not after me. I'm not saying the devil doesn't want to take me. I'm not saying any of that. But what I'm saying is that, man, every time we turn around, we're blaming the devil for something. I hear it all the time. I read it all the time on Wastebook. Did I say Wastebook? I meant Wastebook. Yeah, Wastebook. Wastebook. You say, you have a Wastebook page. I know. It's how I keep up on what church members are doing. All right? But I, I, always, I mean, I Wastebook. And you know what? Here's what people say. Oh, man, the devil tried to get me here, and the devil's doing this and the devil's doing what in the world the devil this the devil that the devil ain't within 100 miles I'm going to defend the devil for 5 seconds this morning get ready uh, I hope he doesn't appreciate it too much he gets blamed for a lot of stuff that's just life we are living in a sin cursed earth a sin cursed world and a sin cursed body Ah, oh, that devil's trying to take me out. Oh, yeah, because you are really getting her done for God. You read your Bible one time this year. You've led no one to Christ in the last 18 decades. You've not gone soul winning. You're doing nothing in your local church. Uh, I mean, you drop in and you drop out and this, that, and the other thing. I'm sure the devil really wants to take you out. Now, that's all the defense. I'm not being harsh this morning. Please, I'm not being harsh. I'm just saying we throw a lot of stuff on the devil. But I will tell you this, maybe he did try to kill you, maybe he didn't try to kill you, I don't have any idea, but I know this, he may not try to kill you, but he may not try to get you by death, but he'll get you by dismemberment. And here's how, he'll cut off your spiritual thumbs, and you'll no longer be able to hold the sword. Hello? Hey, you say, what are you talking about? Uh, maybe we ought to take a journey, and I take you to some Christians that don't have any more Brother Joe's spiritual thumbs. They're not holding a sword anymore. Mm. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. They're not holding the Word of God anymore. Hey, you know what this is good for, Brother Joe? Guess, think about a soldier with me. 
Think about a soldier. I'm going to get hung up here because you looked at me like that, all right? Uh, I mean, he looked at me like, preacher, let her rip, tater chip. And, uh, and so, uh, <laughs> but, I mean, think about a sword. Now, think about a soldier. They didn't have machine guns, rockets, and missiles, and drones. You know, I mean, we can take something out 10,000 miles away by sitting at a computer going, you know, and I'm glad for it, too, and I wish they'd drop about 8 billion more of them. Amen, preacher. Yeah, there was that really ultra-conservative part of me, all right? Uh, <laughs> sorry, it was going to come out eventually. But they, so they had, they had several weapons. There were three in particular that I'll hit quickly. A sword, close quarter fighting. Here's me and Brother John. Boy, we're in a battle. He's the enemy, because he would be the enemy. Uh, he's the enemy. Uh, and here I am. We would have swords. Now, Brother John, for me and you to be in a battle with swords, we're going to be close to each other, right? be able to stab. I call that close quarters fighting, the sword of the Spirit. You know what? A lot of Christians anymore can't hold a sword because the devil's cut off their spiritual thumb. They're not holding the sword anymore, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. They're not holding the Word of God anymore. So number one, I would say that in his, in his war life, your war life would be changed if you had uh, your uh, thumbs cut off. He couldn't hold a sword. That would be close quarters. How about this one? He couldn't hold a spear. Now, a spear would not necessarily be long range, but it would be longer than a sword, right? Have a big, long spear. A lot of soldiers carried that. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, you could get a guy that maybe wasn't in close quarters like this, uh, but I could stand back here and put my spear down. And Brother Elliot's coming at me with his sword. Right, which is maybe uh, maybe four foot long or whatever. If you know, four. I mean, they carried big swords back then. These were strapping men, heavy swords uh, that they would need a full grip on or two to wield that thing. He's coming at me with a sword. He didn't know I have a spear, man. I just dip the spear down, wham, and he doesn't get too close to me. And all of a sudden, now though, hey, it's going to be hard to hold that. Think about it. If I'm just holding it and I don't have a thumb and I'm trying to hold that thing and he runs into that, he's just going to push it right out of my hand. Say, well, you can push it against your, oh yeah, we can compensate for it, but then it might get me. So now I'm no longer able to hold my sword. I'm no longer able to hold, hold my spear. How about this one? I, 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 also, the, I would no, be no longer able to hold a bow. Now a bow would be your long range, long range weapon. I got to start slowing down when I say those things. So here's my sword, close. Here's my spear a little bit further, and I could throw it almost like a javelin, you know, maybe hit someone at the door. But listen, when I was going to use a bow, boy, I'd draw that bow back, and man, I'd shoot it, and it could go a long ways. You ever seen some of that? And boy, get the enemy over there. Almost the enemy that I may not see, but how, how hard do you think it's going to be? How many of you ever been bow hunting before? How many of you ever shot a bow? All right, a few of you. It'd be kind of hard to do all of that without the use of a thumb holding all that, getting all that working together, huh? It kind of takes a hand to do all that. You say, well, you bow, and hey, yeah, you guys have all these fancy tools now. You know, you hook something on there, you pull it back. I mean, come on, these guys, these were soldiers. They needed all their appendages to effectively soldier. But wait, he took 70, cut their thumbs and big toes off. And so they did the same thing to him, and that's what the devil wants to do to you. He wants to take the sword right out of your hand. And he wants to take the spear right out of your hand, Brother Jeff. And somebody in here is carrying a bow, and they've been getting a lot done for the cause of Christ. You've been taking out the enemy. But he says, if I cut your thumb off, I'm going to hamper you, I'm going to hinder you, and you're going to stop working for the Lord. And so I see that uh, definitely uh, his war life is going to uh, change. No spear. No sword, no bow, that was long range. How about this one? You also have no protection. Really? You know what a soldier had back then for protection? A shield. You know what it takes to hold a shield? You lock it right here. If you don't have that, you're going to hold your shield? Kind of be slipping all over the place. Yeah. Stick. Now I have no protection. You know if the devil can rob you of all of that, who are you going to protect yourself from? And how are you going to get anything done for the cause of Christ? We are in a battle. It's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation field. It's a fight and not a game. Amen. So his war life is going to be changed. His work life is going to be changed. He'll be limited in the tasks that he can perform when he doesn't have any thumbs, when he doesn't have any big toes. Pardon me. The devil's aim is to limit your work this morning. Many a Christian has been getting something done for the cause of Christ, 
But the devil has gotten an advantage of them and he hasn't killed them. He, thump, he, he whacked off their thumbs. He whacked off their spiritual big toes and all of a the sudden, they're absolutely not accomplishing anything anymore. They're what I like to call the has-beens. They used to, I used to do this in church, and I used to do this in church, and I used to do this in church. Well, what happened? The devil got an advantage of me. But that's what we ought to say. We. Did you hear me? We ought to say that. The devil got an advantage of me. Well, how'd the devil get an advantage of you? I let him. Because I was not, I was ignorant of his devices. In other words, I knew what his devices were, but ignorance is a choice. Ignorance is a choice. If you're ignorant, it's a choice. You don't have to be ignorant. And so we are not to be ignorant of his devices. And so the devil got an advantage of me, and now I'm not working for the Lord anymore. That's the, boy, the devil sits back and laughs. Why would he kill you? If he can get you to just not do anything for God, he wins. What's he going to come after you for? You're not doing anything. Not doing anything in a local church. Not doing anything for the cause of Christ. I mean, let's be honest. I, I, you were not working for him anymore. We used to. Well, I attend church. That's great. And we're glad you're here and we want you here. Don't take this the wrong way. But there is more to the Christian life than attending church. It's called being the church. We need laborers at Calvary Baptist Church. We need nursery workers. We need soul winners. We need people that are sold out. The bus ministry. We need bus workers. You say, ha, ha, I mean, there's only a few of us. And uh, so? We need, we need people that will work with teens. And we need people that will work with children. And we need people that will teach Sunday school classes. And we need people that will uh, help keep the area clean and keep the snow off of things and ice off of cars or walk old ladies across. Uh, elderly, I'm sorry. Uh, walk, walk elderly ladies across the parking lot while holding an umbrella over them. We need people to stand at the door and say, Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. It's good to have you here today. I mean, there is an endless... Like, we need people to put toilet paper on the roll and tissue on the roll and all of those things. We need that. That's a worker. We're glad you attend. We're glad for people that attend. We're gladder. Is that good English for people that tithe? I just wanted to put it in there because all pastors are after money. So if you want to just attend, would you also just tithe? That would be a blessing. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. <laughs> uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, treasurer told me to say that, and if you want to know who he is, I'll give you his name. He, he paid me to say that. From your money, he paid me to say that. But we need workers, but you know what? The devil wants to cut you off and many a person that was working for God last year in Calvary Baptist Church, last 10 years in Calvary Baptist Church, some aren't doing anything. Well, why did that happen? Well, circumstance. Yeah, the circumstance called the devil getting an advantage on you and cutting off your thumbs and your big toes, and now you can't war, you can't work, you can't witness. I mean, boy, so much gets taken from us. Uh, so if our... If our, if our uh, war life and our work life, how about this? Uh, you'll like this, and don't laugh. Your weight has changed. You say, oh, yeah, I am sure. Yeah, I couldn't hold my fork anymore. I'm not talking about that kind of weight, all right? <laughs> weight as in your influence. That's also a word, weight. This was their king. I'm almost on watch. This was their king and their fearless leader who's now been lost his thumbs and lost his... This is the king. This is the leader. This is someone in charge. And Brother Jeff, now all of a sudden, he has lost the authority. He has lost the respect. Why? He can't do anything. He can't lead people into battle anymore. He loses his influence, and the devil wants you to lose your influence. Do you want to know why the devil wants you to lose your influence? Because you have influence over someone. We all influence someone. You know people influence me? Well, you're the preacher, bless God. So I look, to, I look at other people and I say, ah, they're helping me grow closer to Jesus. They help me. They help me. I'm not looking to them. I'm looking to Jesus. But I like that they follow Jesus, and I think I like following them as they follow Jesus. That's all right. People influence each and every one of us. Think about those people that influence you. But all of us, all of us this morning that have been in Christianity, been in a church for a while, we could all say there was someone that influenced me that is not in church this morning or that is away from God. 
Hmm. You know what the devil did? Whack, whack, took their influence away. They, ne they no longer are going to respect him. So as their, their weight has changed, their walk has changed. No modern shoes like you and I have, they would wear sandals. Now, I don't wear sandals because guys don't wear sandals or flip-flops. Oh, I don't want to see your nasty toe, dude. Put a sock on and get a shoe on that thing. You say, well, preacher, you love going to Florida. Do you wear flip-flops when you're in Florida? None of your business. What I do when I'm in Florida, if I lived there, I'd wear flip-flops and sandals. I'm not Jesus. I don't need sandals. I got shoes, bless God. And I wear them all day until I go to bed. Ask Miss LaFave. She's nodding her head. I wear, uh, like my dad used to say, I was born with shoes on. Amen. Walking around barefoot, this, that, and the other thing. What? No, 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 no. But back then, they wore sandals. All right? Uh, could you imagine that, ladies or guys that wear sandals or flip-flops? It'd be kind of hard without a toe, without your big toe, huh? There's my girls. They, wear, they probably wear flip-flops today. I mean, hey, once the weather gets above 25, the flip-flops, there's flip-flops laying all over the stinking house. They all have, all the women in my house, which it's all women other than me. I'm very outnumbered. They all got 37 pair of flip-flops, and they're everywhere. Black, blue, green, orange, red, this, that. What? Come on. Be kind of hard, though. Your foot would kind of slip through that thing, wouldn't it? Now, this was a soldier. Didn't he need some sure footing? And when you lose your toes, the devil laps, lops that off. Guess what? Your walk is going to be not quite as stable. Your spiritual walk, your Christian walk is going to change when the Lord of Lightning comes along and cuts off your big toe. You know what he wants to do to Calvary Baptist Church, Brother Chris? He wants to cut the big toe off of Calvary Baptist Church so our walk is not the same in Whitmore Lake, Michigan. He does it to individuals. He does it to churches. He tries to destroy. And I want to tell you this morning that we shouldn't be ignorant of his devices. He can no longer walk. He can no longer lead his army into battle. And guess what he becomes? He becomes a hindrance because now they go into battle and they're worried about the king. The king can't keep up. We better make sure the king's protected. And now soldiers are dying because they're worried about protecting the king, the great fearless leader that was taking people into battle, can no longer do anything. And you know what happens? When the devil gets in, starts cutting people's toes and, and, and thumbs off, you know what happens? Others now have to help them get everything done, and the devil then has all these other little skirmishes, starts attacking, and we all go, whoa, 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 what's going on? Well, now listen, it's going to happen. People are going to spiritually struggle. And ye which are spiritual, restore such one in the spirit of meekness, lest thou also be tempted. We're to help others. We're to lift you. I want to help you carry your burden. I want to help you carry your burden. I want to because I love you. I want to because the Bible says I should, and I desire to help you carry your burden. But if we spend all of our time helping you carry your burden, there's going to be other people that we're going to be unable to help. So the walk has changed. The winning life has changed. Last thing, winning life has changed. He's no longer a leader. He's now a loser. He's no longer a soldier, but he's now a slave. He's not a warrior. He's now a wimp. If you note in verse number 7, do you know that he says that he did this to 70 men? And here's what the Bible says. They would, that they gathered meat under his table. I didn't understand that until I began to, you have to think about every word that's there. And I thought that that meant like David and Mephibosheth, where it says that he ate at David's table, but that is not the case. These 70 kings that he did this to gathered meat under his table. You know what that meant? They were dogs. Literally, he threw scraps of food under the table for 70 kings. Seventy warriors were literally, Brother Elliot, groveling under his table for pittance, for scraps. And that's what the devil will do to you. He'll throw you scraps under the table and we're like dogs groveling. Seventy men treated like dogs. Now listen, I could spend a lot of, I, I could probably spend another 30 minutes telling you things that the Lord showed me out of that. How about this? Look at where he said, the Lord hath requited me. You want, you want some scripture on that? It's called the law of sowing and reaping. 
Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And a seemingly lost king understood the rules of sowing and reaping when he said, I did this to 70 and now God is exacting it out of me. Be careful how you treat other people because it's going to come around again. Did you get that? It's going to come around again. Be careful who you're criticizing or who you're trying to hurt and who you're trying to slander and who you're trying to run down because I promise you on the authority of the word of God, it's coming around again and it's going to be much worse on you. It's the rule of sowing and reaping. Closing statement. Here they are. They've lost thumbs and toes. Do you know what they used to do? When a, when a warring army would go in, they would take all the men. So I would look, I would see Brother Elliot, Joe, and uh, this man, and this man, and this man. And I'd go around the room, I'd get all the men. And I would say, now he's a, he could hurt me, and he could hurt me, because these are soldiers. These are, these are guys that were fought in the battle. You know how I'm going dis to disable them? I'm going to cut off his toes and his big thumb. I'm going to cut off his toes and his big thumb. And then I'm going to take him into captivity. And you know what I'm going to do with you? This is what they would do to them. You remember them big pictures of them, uh, them pictures that you've seen? Maybe you've seen some of those movies, that, them big boats. They didn't have motors on them. They had oars. And they would make those guys row their boats because you don't need thumbs to do this. And when the devil takes us captive at his will, that's what Corinthians says. You start rowing the devil's boat, and you're no longer a soldier, you're now a slave. You're no longer a leader, you're now a loser. One more thing I noticed in there, and listen to me, every parent in this room, because I've seen this happen, and it breaks my heart, and it's happening more and more in our society. I'll say this, Brother Jeff, it's happening more and more in Christianity. More and more. Parents would have little children. Brother Eric's not up here, and I know there's other little children. Uh, Miss Becky's got a couple of little boys. They would literally do this. Miss Becky would say, I don't want my kids to go into battle. I don't want my, because that's where all men were going was in the army, in the Roman army. You were going to the Roman army. She would take her boys as little babies, whack, whack, and cut the thumbs off of them so that when it came time and they were grown up, they didn't have any thumbs. They could still make a living doing something, but they could never be accepted into the army. And I got to thinking about that, Brother Chris, this thought came to me. I know many a Christian, many a father and many a mother that cut the thumbs off of their boys and said, you don't want to be in the ministry. There's no money in it. There's no prestige in it. There's no this. There's no that. And they, they, they push them towards it. You know what they do? They cut their boys' thumbs off. And we wonder why we don't have any more warriors. I should have preached just that point right there. We wonder why we don't have any more preachers, Brother Joe. We wonder why we don't, why pulpits are empty, why mission fields are empty, why more missionaries leave the field and go to the field in 2016 and people die and go to hell. While old-time religion that you're sitting in this morning preaching that book right there is going by the wayside for this newfangled garbage that the world's peddling on us, it's because a bunch of so-called, God-fearing, Bible-believing, supposed, supposed Bible-believing, and I could start naming people that I know, multitudes of people that I know, had, had boys and girls that could go into the ministry, be pastor's wife. You don't want to be no pastor's wife. You, you want to do this. You want to do that. Hey, listen, I'm all for kids doing everything. We need lay people, but listen, we need people in the ministry, and we need to stop cutting off our children's thumbs and saying, that's not for you. And we ought to raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and say, Lord, whatever you want done with them, but God, I'd sure like them to see a, be a preacher. I'd sure like them to be a missionary. I'd sure like them to be an evangelist. I'd sure like them to be a good deacon. You say you pray that way every day. For not only my children and grandchildren, God raised them up to